Um, okay, so our program today is um, the religion of responsibility. And we're trying to look at this, this wisdom tradition from three different angles. And so with this third angle is the one we're taking up today. We have um, three speakers. So we've got quite a bit to, to cover. And um, our, our first speaker is going to be Wes. And I'm going to go ahead and fire up a PowerPoint presentation that we're gonna use all together. Everyone can see that. And so today's lecture or a group of lectures is under the title of the religion of responsibility. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wes. By, uh, by many accounts, there are some 4,000 or more religions in the world. So what do they actually do? What are their purposes? And how well do they serve those purposes? Put a different way, compared to what they say they do, what do they, what, what are the actual, what's the actual impact of their actions? So three areas stand out that seem to exemplify the best of religious practices, we could say. Those that would lead at least in the direction of a religion of responsibility. Well, first of all, ethics. All religions teach some sort of foundational ethics. Whatever you sow, that shall ye also reap. Or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They stand out as almost universal principles. Charity, goodwill, forbearance, forgiveness, get lip service at the very least. Uh, second, in, in keeping with these ethical teachings, most religions encourage and support service to others. Not just in word, but in practical deed and example. So you have food kitchens, food banks, homeless shelters, medical care, schools and educational services, sometimes in the poorest of countries and neighborhoods. Third, whether they are ecclesiastical, denominational, community-based or otherwise, churches, mosques and temples offer a sense of community, a sense of belonging to something larger than the individual. And so seen in this way, uh, you could say that it's, it's really in two areas. First, duty, what the Hindus call dharma, obligations based in that particular creed or faith that outline what individuals owe to each other and to themselves. They're often stated in clear rules of conduct. And secondly, in, in, part of the community is what we would call social rituals. Marriages, baptisms, funerals, a coming of age, and rites of passage to adulthood. Things like quinceañeras or a bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah. Uh, things that are echoes almost of, would seem of ancient initiation ceremonies. So even people with only a passing interest in the doctrines and dogmas of a particular church often incorporate these rituals into their lives. Attending church often enough to include their families out of a need for a common social basis. So often an effective, compassionate, and communicative pastor, priest, rabbi, imam, or some other church leader is often essential to these kinds of churches because they serve as a binding force in the community. And so to them and to those that practice these religions in good faith, we really can say no more than what H.P. Blavatsky did in her preface to the second volume of Isis Unveiled. She wrote, were it possible, we would keep this work out of the hands of many Christians whom its perusal would not benefit and for whom it was not written. We allude to those whose faith in their respective churches is pure and sincere and those whose sinless lives reflect the glorious example of that prophet of Nazareth, by whose mouth the spirit of truth spake loudly to humanity. Such there have been at all times. Their followers, whose charity and simple childlike faith in the infallibility of their Bible, their dogmas, and their clergy, bring into full activity all the virtues that are implanted in our common nature. So, 
For those who have questions about their faith, however, and seek answers beyond the tenets and dogmas of any particular organized religion, or if none, uh, theosophy actually has a lot to say. Let's start with what Irish-American theosophist William Q. Judge wrote in an article called The Synthesis of Occult Science. If a consensus of religion, philosophy, and science is possible, and if it has ever been reached in human thought, that thought must long since have passed the boundaries of all creeds and ceased to, be dog to dogmatize. So religion, by that kind of definition, uh, going back to the Latin roots of the name, uh, the Latin religare, religare, to bind back as to a common source, should bind all of life, all humanity, everything into one whole. If religions by themselves united people and included all aspects of human knowledge and inquiry, how could we even criticize them? But instead, all too often, what do we find? Sectarianism, institutions, money, doctrines and dogma, and conflict. So one set of religious ideas competes with another. How could all be true? Whether they are monotheistic, polytheistic, animist, or otherwise, religions often begin as revolutionary or reaction, even reactionary cults, but then they fracture into sects which further fracture again and again. They become more and more dogmatic as decades and centuries roll on. So institutions of formal structures, call them churches or whatever, these almost inevitably follow the establishment of a religion. Money. Churches, by whatever name, become financial centers, dependent for funds upon either a central authority, uh, upon their congregation, or perhaps a persuasive, charismatic leader who might even take advantage of their charity. At any rate, donations and money become the lifeblood of the operation. Doctors and doctrines and dogmas, either intentionally or gradually because of human frailties, uh, religious teachings become creeds that little resemble the initial inspiration of their founders. Now, whatever the savior or founder intended, these ideas become crystallized and distorted by followers. And in fact, we actually get ideas that encourage a lack of responsibility. Uh, doctrine of, very, of vicarious atonement, for example, particularly noted in Western religions, so what happens is the sacred ideal of the, of the savior, who, which should point each human being toward their own spiritual nature, their own innate powers of intuition and reason become instead a crutch, a kind of a scapegoat and substitute for individual responsibility. And finally, conflict, sectarian, sectarian views, dogmas, rigid institutions and money, all too often lead to wars, insurrections, persecutions, torture, murder. So, what would a religion of responsibility look like? Well, first of all, it should be all inclusive and leave no one out. How can it be other than essentially a, a universal brotherhood? And a component of that would seem essentially to be nonviolence. Second, it should be non sectarian, non dogmatic. How could there be mandatory doctrines if it's, we're including everyone? Non institutional, the less church, however that's defined, the less structure would probably be better. This would lead to a complete freedom of conscience for the individual. In effect, it's a respect for the self-induced and self-devised efforts of everyone. And finally, a religion of responsibility would seem to necessarily be 
synthetic. By that we mean it should be seamlessly integrated and connected to the other main areas of human concern, science and philosophy. With these parameters in mind, we will explore today some of these ideas suggested by our topic. The religion of responsibility as laid out by several other speakers in somewhat similar fashion over the past two weeks under the headings of the science of spirituality and philosophy of perfectibility. So however we eventually come to define them, religion, science, and philosophy must eventually transcend each other. They have to become part of a synthetic whole. They are in fact, three aspects of the search for truth. And we'll see these examined in our next two presentations. Thank you, Thank you very much, Wes. Um, our next speaker um, is Laura Gray, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Wes, and thank you, everyone, um, for joining in today. It's interesting, the um, all the world religions, as was indicated, uh, show this feeling of responsibility that humanity has. And um, as was said, we'll explore that further. Looking at music, you know, when we, at the beginning, for those who were able to listen to the wonderful harpist and the um, violinist play together, we can see that each of them had to prepare their instrument. They had to find one, first of all, and then they had to tune it. They had to prepare themselves. They had a responsibility to each other and to their audience to um, come fully prepared, fully ready, to play that piece of music by the composer. This will be our reply to violence, to make music more intensely, more beautifully, more devotedly than ever before, says Leonard Bernstein. We all have instruments that need to be trained and we need to practice with them. And once these instruments are fully tuned, the light of our highest intention can shine through them. We have to take compassion and turn it into compassion if we're ever going to solve the problem of violence. When asked, why do you wanna dance? The dancer said, when I dance, I cease to exist. The subject and object become one as it always is. The world of phenomena along with the pure subjectivity of consciousness represent opposite polarities of a single reality. Bernstein would say, when I can make the music outside sound like the music inside, I am in heaven. When we recognize this unity, we can feel what the Gita means when it says, the man who is devoted and not attached to the fruits of his action obtains tranquility. When we feel that there is no separation between us and any other creature, and that our higher self is leading us through all the experiences of life, we shall recognize the unity of all and act for the self of all. R. W. Emerson, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. It is not the length of the life, but the depth that matters. We are always getting ready to live, but never living. 
What lies behind you, what lies in front of you, pales in comparison to what lies inside of you. The voice of the silence speaks of this self, like a bird that sits torpid in a cage and warbles not. We have a responsibility to shine through the actions and thoughts, a universal application of virtue. The actions themselves are not real, but it is the attitude we have while acting that is the greatest influence. Let us hit the mark, oh friend, and that mark is the indestructible, the highest spiritual life we are at any time capable of says William Q. Judge. What is this highest spiritual life? It seems to grow and expand with time and experience. Truth or self can never be fully realized. It seems that there's a boundlessness to it, that it has neither beginning nor ending. We can only express what we have become a truer realization. We express this awareness through the senses of our form, the same as a musician expresses his music through the strings of an instrument. So this form, as Judge Pictures shows, must be tuned to express the highest thought. Think of all the lives in that picture and the focus and quality of thought that they are being impressed with. Like the music of Bernstein, the shooting of the arrow requires a devoted focus on the lives within the form, a training, a lifting up of matter for consciousness to express itself. From the voice of the silence, if thou wouldest have that stream of hard earned knowledge of wisdom, heaven born, remain sweet running waters, thou shouldest not leave it to become a stagnant pond. It is not only the children we can see in the picture that are being impressed with the teacher's words, but that it is the atmosphere that is as well that is part of the lesson that the teacher is giving. The secret doctrine points this out further on page one, or volume one, page 583. Every monad reflects every other. Every monad is a living mirror of the universe within its own sphere. And mark this, for upon it depends the power possessed by these monads, and upon this depends the work they can do for us in mirroring the world. The monads are not mere passive reflective agents, but spontaneously self-active. They produce the images spontaneously as the soul does a dream. In every monad, therefore, the adept may read everything, even the future. Every monad or elemental is a looking glass that can speak. The great musician Yehudi Menuhin. The ultimate aim in life should be to fulfill to the utmost all that within our ability and to share what is good and beautiful. Little by little, we lift up matter to express the good and the beautiful. Now we look at science. David Bohm, the theoretical physicist. He states the entire universe must, on a very accurate level, be regarded as a single indivisible unit the profound discovery of interconnectedness of the universe at the fundamental level of quantum conflicts 
with the relative theory, which means there exists a hidden realm of reality where everything is interconnected. Ultimately, the entire universe with all its particles, including those constituting human beings, their laboratories, their observing instruments, etc., has to be understood as a single undivided whole in which analysis into separately, independently existent parts has no fundamental status. So here we are. We see the examples of universal thought. And as Albert Schweitzer said, example is not the main thing in life. It is the only thing. The great teachers and others through time and civilizations have given these perennial truths in many ways and forms. We as receivers of these ideas have a responsibility to put them to work to check, test, and verify them, and then share them. The value of ideas lie in the using of them. They won't keep. Something must be done with them. So with this as a basis and an, of exploration and contemplation, we look at our responsibility to nature, to humanity, and to our own effort of becoming. So much of what we have, what we are, and what we're made of is due to the lives of others, now, in the past, and in the future. We see that we do not, that we do have a responsibility to use our minds, desires, and bodies in such a way that others too may benefit. The etymology of the word responsibility is very interesting. It includes the concept to respond, to promise, to pledge, which comes from the word spondere as well. And spondere is an interesting word because sponda means vibration. We must do something with what we are surrounded with. That something is colored either by selfishness or selflessness, or a mix of both. To be human is to self-analyze, to perceive our thoughts and feelings and desires. And from that position of perceiving, we can change them. We are a power that can create, preserve, and destroy. And in the world of cause and effect, we are responsible for the results we surround ourselves with. All the religions and their scriptures indicate humanity has this responsibility. What is the nature of this responsibility? We can see that it is not only to ourselves, to one's group or family. It includes a wider range. And the responsibility um, includes our actions, our thoughts, and our feelings. The wisdom religion indicates that humanity has a responsibility to raise up matter, that nature unaided fails. And as thinkers on this earth, we bring the power of mind and all its forms to bear upon the elemental, the mineral, the vegetable, and the animal kingdom. Every thought, feeling, and action, we are told, leaves its impress on the lives around us. From responsibility comes the response, a student so wonderfully shared. How we respond to our conditions and circumstances creates an effect for the future. The conditions and circumstances we are in is a result of our past whether we know of that past or not. So rather than reacting to the condition, we can choose to respond consciously in such a way that will sow better causes for tomorrow. As another student shared, 
Once we fall off a cliff or jump off a cliff, we have only one choice left, and that choice is our attitude. Within the conditions we find ourselves, we can choose to learn and to act through them for the greater good of life. Our selfishness enables the selfishness of others. Our altruism strengthens the altruism of others. And from the Dhammapada, by self do you censor yourself. By self do you examine yourself. Self-guarded and mindful, O oh Bhikkhu, you will live happily. Self indeed is the protector of self. Self indeed is one's refuge. Control, therefore, your own self as a merchant controls a noble steed. And from Confucius, the wise man seeks what he seeks is in himself. What the selfish man seeks is in others. And William Q. Judge, life would be a contest of smiles if we only, only knew our business. A knowledge of unity, of karma and reincarnation, and of the fullness of evolution is to be woven into our daily life and thoughts. Knowing who we are as spiritual pilgrims, knowing how manifested existence has come to be, we pick up with virtue all the instruments we have within us and without and set about the royal duty of humanity to live the higher life while in a body. And as Jacob Bone said, replace personal will with divine will. To act for and as the self of all that lives. And so the work begins with this high motive before us. It is not an easy task to conquer the passionate nature. And for each of us, it is a different path, but the goal is the same. We see in the work of Leonard Bernstein, the way of lifting up matter through music. And we too have a seven stringed lyre. It's our sevenfold nature. And so it too must be tuned in order to reflect the highest that we are. Laura, many thanks. Uh, we'll turn over the stage to Steve Levy. Thank you, Jerry. Friends, welcome to this consideration of the religion of responsibility. Facing the truth is one of the most difficult and challenging tasks a human being can consider. And yet, if we don't face the truth at some point in our lives, progress in spirituality and the religious life is not possible. So it is necessary. Theosophy would have us consider the truth that human beings are innately responsible for their spirituality and religious aspirations, the path they choose. And yet for many of the reasons mentioned by the first speaker, more people a day around the world, in the United States and other industrial countries and other countries of the world, find that religion no longer provides them a source for meaning and support in their lives. More and more young people question how and if religion will help them survive in the 21st century. But this is a common and timeless human concern. 5,000 years ago on an ancient battlefield, Arjuna, 
one of the most revered, skilled, and courageous warrior in that part of the world found himself facing, ready to engage in the most important battle of his life. And yet his arms could no longer support the bow and arrow he held. His feet could no longer help him stand in the chariot. And his heart was overwhelmed with despair and hopelessness, his mind whirling with doubt, uncertainty, and chaos. And so we turn for guidance. Krishna, his friend, charioteer, mentor, offered him this advice, this truth. The man whose heart and mind are not at rest is without wisdom or the power of contemplation. Who doth not practice reflection hath no calm. And how can a man without calm obtain happiness? In the late 20th century, the poet, songwriter, musician, Leonard Cohen, echoed these, this timeless truth to his contemporary audience. And he said, if you don't become the ocean, you will be seasick every day. Yet, it is within that ocean of spiritual life that there is calmness and joy. And religion serves a purpose of pointing out the way to the shores of that ocean. And yet also within the depths of that ocean, there is wisdom. There are treasures in the form of answers to the greatest mysteries of life. Is there life after death? Or is physical life and experience all that there is? Is there right and wrong? Or is morality only relative to the end in view? Sentimental, self-serving. Is there a higher purpose to life or is there no other meaning than physical survival and the sustaining and securing of pleasure? So theosophy is not a religion and yet it may be considered to be that universal bond of unity. We've heard that expressed already today. So HPB offers us this definition, if you will, of religion. A religion in the true and only correct sense is a bond uniting men together. Not a particular set of dogmas and beliefs. Now religion per se in its widest meaning is that which binds not only all men, but also all beings and all things in the entire universe into one grand whole. Theosophy would add to this all-inclusive definition of religion. The understanding that human, being, human beings have a responsibility to realize and to help others realize this fundamental unity of life and a responsibility to live and act in harmony with that spiritual unity and ultimately to endeavor to become a self-conscious manifestation of that all-encompassing unity. 
So we've used many times today this word responsibility. And we wondered if we could assume a practical understanding of what it is. Responsibility is ultimately the fact of having the power, the control, the authority, and the duty to make independent decisions. And the key to the religion of responsibility is that human beings are innately capable of making those decisions as to the path they will pursue in their spiritual religious life, even though these are independent position, positions and the path may vary with the pilgrim, with the individual, the ultimate goal is the same. So HPB gives us a hint in the secret doctrine in very beautiful, succinct words of what might be the essence of this religion of responsibility. And she writes, the ever unknowable and incognizable Karana alone, the causeless cause of all causes, should have its shrine and altar on the holy, ever untrodden ground of the heart, invisible, intangible, unmentioned, save through the still small voice of our spiritual consciousness. Those who worship before it ought to do so in the silence and sanctified solitude of their souls, making their spirit the sole mediator between them and the universal spirit. Their good intentions the only priests, and their sinful intentions the only visible and objective sacrificial victims to the presence. Now, in order to understand the depth and beauty of these words, we have to take a few minutes to explore psychology, the science of the soul in the light of theosophy. Karana, the causeless cause, the ever unknowable, the universal supreme spirit is what is meant by deity. The spirit or deity within, the God within, if you will, called Atma in the Sanskrit, is one and inseparable from the universal spirit. And spirit, whether whether we speak it of in the universal sense or the spirit within, is the cause and sustainer of all, and yet itself is unaffected, unchanging, and transcending of all. In our quote, the still small voice of spiritual perception and consciousness and is called booty. And here we have Audrey Odney and her thread the thread of the continuity of our immortal existence as souls, the thread of intuition that guides us through the maze of confusion of the senses and intellect to a direct knowing of truth. These are all aspects that we experience within our awareness of the presence of Buddhi spiritual perception. It is the seat and origin of our highest perceptions of faith, the sacred, devotion, love, our highest perception of intuition, spiritual wisdom, and truth. It is the heart that nourishes with the light of our spiritual nature. And the most we can know about it, this divine presence is through booty. So it is in a sense, the altar spoken of in the quote, upon which we can sacrifice our sinful intentions and offer up our good intentions. 
And we experience this presence, this Buddhistic Buddhi influence in through the mind. Manas is the Sanskrit word for mind. It is the thinking principle, but it is also an entity, a spiritual enduring entity intelligence that incarnates and works through the physical brain. It is, we say, the real human being, the inner knower, the witness, the thinker, the human soul mentioned in our quote. And we sense the presence of this spiritual entity we call Manus by the fact that every human being is self-conscious and self-consciously aware of themselves as individuals, capable of making decisions as how they will act and react, whether they will follow the higher and the lower or follow the better or the dearer in their nature. It has been noticed that the healing of oneself and others is one of the most important aspects of the religion of responsibility. It is no accident that the priests in the ancient temples were also healers. Krishna, Buddha, Jesus were known to be great healers. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 23, we read, Physician, heal thyself, supposed words of Jesus. But he's not referring to physician as a profession, but as we will see, the physician within each and all. So healing then is a personal experience of transcending suffering as religion is a personal experience of transcending where religion restores us to unity with the all. Healing, self-healing or healing others restores harmony and freedom, transcendence of disease. And so a few months ago, we came across uh, an acronym uh, expressed to us by a life coach. And in it, we found keys by which we could practically take what we've spoken about in our three presentations this morning, apply them to ourselves for self-healing and the religion of responsibility, but also in trying to help others perhaps those who have no knowledge of the teachings of theosophy. And as we go through them, you will see that they are expressions of theosophical ideas, but they also are self-evident truths that anyone can recognize in their lives. So what we need to remember is this acronym PEACE, or P-E-A-C-E. -E. And we will go through each one of these letters and talk a little bit about how we can apply them in our lives. So the first is peace, or P. Find that place within of calmness, of rest, based on turning our awareness within to that which is changeless, the impersonal, the I, which has no attributes, and realize that every human being that is self-conscious is capable of recognizing that individual identity of I that does not change. This is the mental devotion, the meditation, the contemplation, which is the foundation of the religion of responsibility. And it is the panacea that the ancient sages offered us for relieving all that afflicts the mind. And so from this, we turn to E. From the foundation of our place of calm and peace, we try to empty the mind as well as encourage the mind. From our place in observation as the witness observer, 
we notice all the changes, all the changing desires and passions. We notice the memories of that which is pleasant or that which is unpleasant, the fears of what may happen in the future, and recognizing that they are changeable and not basically ourselves, we let them go. We release them from our minds and instead encourage in our minds thoughts of the highest ideals, our ends in view, the virtues. This is the devotion, the sacrifice of the religion of responsibility, while it is also the diet, the fasting of self-healing. As Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone but by these inner truths, which one has to continuously encourage and nourish. And so we turn to A, which is action. And from the place of our rest and realization of the self, the I within each and all, we act for and as that self of all, acting to the best of our ability. This is the highest aspiration, the ideal of service, to all of humanity, regardless of their condition. And it is what takes our mundane activities in life and converts them into devotional acts. And like fresh water and fresh air, it purifies the mind and heart in the attempt towards self-healing. And then we move towards C control from the place of our self as the observer the witness we notice the wanderings of the mind and heart our thoughts and feelings and endeavor to control them to make them one-pointed to refocus them again and again on our higher ideals on our self as spiritual beings as the witness the observer our ends in view this one-pointedness devotion of bringing things back to our one-pointed consideration is the discipline of the disciple of the religion of responsibility. But it is also the exercise that must be practiced daily by the person who endeavors to heal themselves and help others heal. And finally, we come to E, which is energy. We need to energize the will, the action of ourselves as spiritual being. But behind will stands desire. Desire is necessary for every action. Desire energizes the will, and the will leads to the accomplishment of whatever we can imagine. So this energy, this awaking of our spiritual will is the will prayer of the religion of responsibility. And it is ultimately the inner physician which helps us in our efforts towards self-healing and freedom and transcendence from suffering, allows us to live in the world and yet never not suffer the pangs of self-conscious existence. Thank you. We don't hear you. At, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the um, reactions button. And you can use that as one way to kind of get my attention um, by putting your hand up. And then I'll kind of call on you in order. 
uh, we're going to open it up to a general discussion for everybody now. Um, if you also kind of just wave, <laughs> hopefully I'll see you. Um, but we'll have um, 30 minutes now to have a general discussion. Feel free to bring up any questions, uh, not only about the um, lecture to three lectures today, but for the series as a whole. Um, all three speakers today put a lot of thought into not just the religion of responsibility, but how these three ideas, these three different perspectives of see as Wes said at the beginning, three different ways of seeking for truth. Uh, all three speakers in conversations I've had with them while we were preparing for this, put a lot of thought into the relationship of the three talks. So feel free to bring up um, anything that comes to mind about any one of the three uh, lecture topics. So um, do we have any uh, first question? Don't be shy. It's just us. <laughs> okay, Mr. Miller. And then Tony, you, you'll go next. Go ahead, I, uh, Joe. I couldn't find my digital hand, so I had to use it. <laughs> I'll take the literal one. I'm putting one into it. Um, I want to pick up on the last, um, last point that Stephen mentioned. He reminded me of a passage I quickly looked up. Um, this is a question about prayer. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, often uh, we hear in theosophical circles, I mean, I usually hear sort of a frowning on the idea of prayer because, it, of course, it reminds us of petitioning a personal deity. And I wonder, though, if we could explore that a little bit. Maybe what's the difference between prayer and meditation? Um, we know that, um, that Gandhi, you know, uh, prayer was a big part of his life, and he's, he uh, wrote uh, quite a lot about prayer. But I'm thinking of a passage now by uh, Damodar Mavlankar. Uh, he says, um, as has been said in Isis Unveiled, we believe prayer is the giving expression to the desire, which generates will. And this will is all powerful. Its effect depending, of course, upon surrounding conditions. And he says, what we regret is the degeneration of this real prayer, the outward expression of the inward feeling, into a meaningless jumble of words. So that's my question. Okay, so we're going to give um, Steve just a little bit more rest, and we'll let's direct it to Wes, and then and then uh, Steve, if you want to add to what Wes has to say, feel free to do that. So let's. Um, um, Wes, would you like to respond to Joe's question? Sure, sure. It's, it's, a, it's a great question, Joe. And I, I think the, the quote that you, you had really sp speaks to the issue. Uh, whether, whether prayer is outwardly directed or inwardly directed seems to be the essential difference. An outwardly directed prayer is one asking for somebody else, some other power to, to do something for us, for forgiveness, for strength, for whatever it is. Uh, an inward directed prayer would seem to be a, a force of one's own will, uh, finding a, a course of action and appealing not to the outside higher authority, but to the inside higher authority, the inner higher, if you will, the, the, the inner God within, because we are that universal being. We just have forgotten that we are. So it's really an appeal to our own essential nature. The, uh, I think Blavatsky in her key to theosophy uses a phrase, will, will prayer, rather than uh, simply the degraded form, as Damodar's point points out, kind of a, uh, a, a degraded form of, of, of will uh, that uh, is usually passes for prayer. But that's not to say that in, in many traditions, the, the, the will aspect is, is very much part of uh, the intention of, of prayer. So we can't just make blanket statements saying that religionists misuse the term or, or don't pray properly or whatever. It really becomes an individual matter. And, and I think that goes back to one of the, the points that's made a couple of times is that individual initiative is really important part of of, of religion. It ties us together, but we have to be tied together intentionally. It, it's, it, there, there's, a, there's a natural community, we could say, of, 
uh, uh, everything, the air we breathe and the water we drink and the earth we walk on, the sunlight and everything else of the entire planet. But there's also a, an, an internal community, an, an identical spiritual nature that if we appeal to that, then we really appeal to the highest in everything. Hmm. And I think that's, that, that was really the, the, the important and, and probably an original intention of the whole idea of prayer. Steve, would you like to add to that? Uh, no, just uh, two quick remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, from what you may have gathered from the acronym, uh, in order for there to be real, true, or what we call true prayer, it has to be preceded by meditation, or what mm. Plato calls an ardent turning of the soul towards the divine. Towards the divine. And also, HPB uh, said, um, uh, we as theosophists don't pray, we act. So it's not just a, a turning within a, a will statement, but taking that image, taking that highest and acting on it, putting it into the expression of words and particularly actions on this plane. I, I wanted to um, direct this to, I know, Laura, you have something to say on this too, but I'm, I want to um, ask you a question, Laura, and then maybe even open it up to other people in the group. Um, concerning this prayer topic, we, we uh, in in one of our discussion groups on Thursday, we had we do uh, Theosophy and Cinema, and this last one that we did this Thursday was um, a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and um, one of the practices that um, Mr. Rogers engaged in was every morning he woke up in the morning, and he prayed for the people in his life. And he, he made lists of people that would contact him and would communicate with him. And he made it a practice each morning to pray for them and wish them well. And, and so I'm wondering, um, you know, this is a very um, conventional uh, and I think altruistic activity that he engaged in. What is the benefit of that kind of prayer? Is that not a, a worthwhile practice? What do you think, Laura? It, it is a worthwhile practice. Um, there's been some scientific research done on that, on how, um, I think it was done in Europe, where they took um, people that were not feeling well or who were going through a difficult time, and they split them into two groups. And then they took another group of people and um, they said, okay, we would like you to pray in whatever way you wish, doesn't matter. We want you to think about these people and wish them well. And the other people, they did not do that with, on the, that were having a difficult time. And then after a few weeks of that, they um, went. They interviewed the people that had been prayed for by the group, and discovered that they did better than the people that weren't prayed for. That there was a in that experiment, they saw that the the people that had um, good thoughts and good feelings directed towards them. Um, healed much more quickly, overcame their difficulties, gained some strength. So there does seem to be a benefit to it. The danger of prayer is, as Irshad Manji said, and she is a Muslim, and uh, she wrote that the problem with ritual is that after a while it becomes empty of its intention. The ritual loses its meaning. As she said, the purpose of, of um, prayer to Mecca four times a day is to remind oneself that you are a spiritual being. And, but after a while, she found that the people around her, they did not hold those ideas. They were too busy thinking about what they were going to do when they were done or what they did yesterday, that the, the ritual became empty. So this theosophical idea, as was pointed out by Wes, of putting our prayer into action for others, 
prevents that kind of empty ritual from overwhelming us. So there's, again, it, be, it all goes down to concentration and our ability to concentrate. And then what we concentrate on that creates the pair, the, the prayer and the, um, the, the meaning of it. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Anthony, before we go on to your question, because I'm assuming your question's in a different direction, uh, I wanted to just stay with this prayer and meditation um, question that Joe's raised. Uh, Jonathan, were you going to, to talk on that same question topic, or do you have something new? You need to unmute so we can hear you. Sorry about that. A little bit new, but following following what's been said. So. Okay, so if, if, if it's in line with this uh, Joe's question, go ahead. I'm going to let you jump in front of Anthony. Okay, I'm not sure if that's... Okay, okay. so my question was going to be a little bit of an overlap between the religion of responsibility and the science of spirituality. Okay, hold on, I'm going to stop you. <laughs> well, it's going to have so, to do with motives. Sorry. Okay, that's, no, 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 I'm sure it's related. Everything's related in theosophy. I just didn't want to be unfair to Anthony. Um, I'll give you the very next question, if you don't mind. Anthony, go ahead. You, what would you like to say? Um. Thank you, Jonathan. You can jump. You can jump in front of me anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Now, um, the um, religion of responsibility. I I thought of the quote of um, Mr. Judge when he said that the duty, which is you know akin to responsibility, is the royal talisman. Now, I was thinking, is there, you know, that word talisman? can have many different meanings. So what do we make of this word of Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Um, uh, judge when he says that duty is the royal talisman? Is there an exoteric explanation and perhaps a more esoteric explanation of this word talisman? Okay. Um, let's, I, I want also the, the all there, there's, what 50 almost 50 people in on the call right now um i want to be able to uh, enable any of you to respond to these questions i know the the three speakers today would want it that way but um would anyone like to respond to the question of um the talisman go ahead monica unmute can't hear you yet Ap apologies um Thank you. I had this uh, in my mind uh, uh, kind of recently. And so the thing that um, I'm thinking is that talismans are supposed to be uh, containers and holders of uh, uh, what you would like to receive. And in that way, they, um, they have a magnetism. And so I'm thinking that what Mr. Judge means is that Dharma is a magnet to realization. Mm. That uh, doing our duty and being focused as we uh, accomplish our responsibilities on the self of all um, gives us that that we draw that experience and that, uh, um, that reality to ourselves. Mm, thank you very much. Maria, were you going to respond to this talisman question? Unmute, I can't hear you yet. There you go. My um, response was going to be to the earlier question, but I think it might, might also relate uh, thank you, Monica. Um, my question had to do with how all of this, including the, um, the, the practice of prayer and the practice of duty as a kind of protection or talisman on, on the path, how does it relate to self-knowledge? How, for example, um, self-knowledge in the voice of the silence is... Um, uh, the result of, of, of duty, of, of loving deeds, the child, um, we're told. 
And um, if I am, for example, and this is a dilemma for me now, if I am to assist in the situation, for example, in Ukraine, which weighs on my heart, how do I come to know that the forces in play in that war are within myself? And, and if I act for them in prayer or contemplation, what is it that needs to happen within myself that uh, assists me to realize that I'm not a superior person praying for someone in trouble or doing evil, but I am a companion uh, in a journey we're all undertaking together. Thank you for that. And uh, Jonathan, I appreciate your patience. Um, Laura, would you like to respond to that? It's a beautiful question, Maria, and um, one that we all feel. It's, I think it all comes down to passion and um, that we have to change it, as you so well put, into compassion. So we have to look within ourselves and see where we might need to adjust or tune our instrument, just as the musician tunes theirs before they go out to perform. And so before we pray, we must make sure that we are thinking universally, that we are thinking with compassion, that there's no anger or hatred or frustration within us, and that we um, are speaking directly with the heart. And as was mentioned about Mr. Rogers, and he had that equanimity, no matter who he met or uh, who he was with, he had that feeling of equanimity. Um, so we need to have that as well, that before we begin to pray, or we could do more harm than good. And um, so thank you for your question. And maybe someone else can expand on that further. Yeah, I want to give Wes a chance to weigh in too. Wes, would you like to respond to Maria's question? Yeah, it's it's a good one, and 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 perhaps I think each individual has to sort of sort that out, if you will, for themselves. For some people, it would it might mean uh, volunteering, it might mean sending some money, it might mean doing some actual practical thing to help to help someone else. Uh, for others, it, it might be simply a matter of, of examining our inner perspective, examining our own thoughts and so forth. But if, if one were, were really, uh, I think, trying to be somehow a, a, a practical force for good, it, 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 the outer expressions are often follow the 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 inner inner promptings of our hearts so for each individual doing what seems best and and most useful at the time might look different on to the outside but uh, on the inside it's all based on the the, the same kind of uh, more universal motive and that's perhaps the best we as humans can do is to uh, move our motives and our thoughts in a more universal direction than we were previously and, and trying to, to, to get it just right or, or perfect, uh, it may not be possible. But for some, it might mean sending a little money. For someone else, it might be helping out a neighbor. It's whatever we do to make the world a better place has its, its effect and its outcome. But it does start with the heart. It does start with the motive. Which is a perfect segue into Jonathan's question, who has patiently waited his turn. So Jonathan, please um, oh. offer your, now's the perfect time to hear your question. Um, all of the uh, answers that have been given are really the answers to my question, I think. So, but I'll just tell but you- But ask what. it again, ask it again. Here we go. Can't hurt. I'm gonna get fancy and try and overlap it with uh, the religion of responsibility with the science of spirituality, kind of like you told it to, right? Okay, <laughs> so anyway, um, but just the idea that theosophically um, we are all kind of emanating influences around us and that we're responsible for our emanations. Um, and I was wondering how that kind of would tie into the religion of responsibility. Uh, especially Pierre in the, one of the opening talks uh, was talking about motive so much. 
but we've been talking about that anyway. So, well, I think we have Pierre in our midst. Do we not, Pierre? Would you like to offer a thought or two? Uh, on the the way that we influence other people and general thoughts in the world, and that sort of covers the last couple of questions, is that the whole of humanity, whether dead or alive, are actually one mind. HVB says that our mind, as one of our principles, corresponds cosmically to Mahat. And Mahat is that one mind. So our capacity to think, not our thinking itself or our perception, but our potentiality to think resides in that Mahat. But we are connected to that Mahat through individual channels. And each channel represents each one's uh, self-consciousness. So whatever we think or feel, because feeling is still a part of the mind, that is through that individualized channel still connected with that Mahat. And there are recorders in that Mahat referred to as the Lipika, who also relate to karma. And so whatever we think and feel is recorded within that, what you can call in its manifested condition, the cosmic mind. And that cosmic mind reflects those ideas and thoughts back on humanity as a whole. So anybody who is susceptible to a particular type of feeling or thought that we send into that universal mind is reflected on the whole of humanity and those who respond to it act on it. Okay? So in that sense, the whole of humanity uh, bears a responsibility to everybody else. That's what I can contribute. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Ray, I'm gonna hold off just for a minute. Uh, I see your hand up and I recognize you, but we're gonna, there's two things I wanna do before we turn to you, Ray. Uh, first, I wanna add a comment of my own to the question about the motive. You, if you wanted to put it in very simple terms, you, you might be able to say that the question we put before ourselves in regard to motive is one of two questions. And they're kind of like opposite poles. The, the first is, how can I serve? How can I help? The other side of that is, what's in it for me? And there's a continuum between those two questions that is basically a tension, a struggle, a battle even, you know, within each human being's heart and mind. And we have to slowly sift through, you know, is my intention to serve? Is my intention to get something out of it? And I just thought that was a nice, simple way of putting kind of the motive challenge that each person has. I wanted to raise a question to Steve before we turn to Ray. Um, because in previous conversations preparing for today, he had some very novel ideas about how the three topics that we were covering in the lecture series came together and how they were connected to each other. And I wondered if you wouldn't mind, Steve, um, sharing those thoughts with us right now. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so when we first found out about this, these three lectures, uh, we were impressed by the beauty of the titles, uh, the science of spirituality, the repetition of consonants, and the philosophy of perfectibility, and the religion of responsibility. Uh, but then in thinking more about it, it occurred to us, uh, as we took part and listened to the various presentations, that science doesn't have a special hold on uh, spirituality, nor does philosophy on perfectibility or religion on responsibility. There has to be a science of perfectibility and spiritual uh, and uh, responsibility, as well as a religion of spirituality and uh, uh, perfectibility. So we actually have six or seven word <laughs> presentations we could give with little variations on those. Uh, so it, it reminds us that not only does theosophy synthesize science, religion, and philosophy, but it reminds us that the path to spirituality, the path to perfectibility, the path to responsibility is all one path. 
and we can view it from many di different directions, but we end up at the same point. And I think that's a wonderful idea for us to reflect on as we review and listen to these presentations again. I appreciate that. But the the uh, synthetic nature of the of Theosophia is such an important one to contemplate. Uh, Ray, thank you for being patient. Um, I don't see your hand up at the moment, but the floor is yours if you want it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all I can say is that it's uh, there's that uh, expression uh, that um, goes. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry that you're at the end of the line. And it came to a, a little boy and he said, well, that's okay. I don't mind. Someone has to be last. There might be added to that child's reaction. Also, you get the benefit of what everyone else has managed to acquire that came before you. And the um, just what I would say is that the gentle comprehensiveness of this last 15 or 12, well, the whole commentary of question and answer that had brought us to this point. Uh, it, 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 my, my question happened to be a very simple one, which has been covered from all three of these directions that the three various presentations have been made, not just today, but over the last three um, subject matters of science, philosophy, and religion. And it, it was how the how the negative, what we consider the negative side of our progress through growing up, as it were, in an inner spiritual life proceeds. And I'm, um, I, I, I don't know how to put the paradoxical way I feel about this, and they, but I'll just say it and stumble through it. To me, our progress only seems to occur when we stumble and make mistakes. And that the uh, idea of moving into our inner self is a process of stumbling and making mistakes. Inner reflection is the same kind of thing. And if there is equanimity in that, which I think there is always, uh, even in the worst of circumstances, and um, uh, it wasn't Laura, but um, someone else made the comment about how do we deal with what is happening in Ukraine, for example, and hold, hold the suffering and pain that's going on there. And I don't have a, solu a solution to that, but I'd kind of like to ask the question, how can we take these worst things that are happening and without, everyone has their ideal. Um, Ray, I think I can help you here. Good, thank I you. I think I can help you here. So, it, it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is it, can we only make progress in any direction, perhaps, through mistakes? Is that the only way that progress is, can be um, attained? Or are there other ways that are less painful <laughs> For, for to move forward. How, how does that, Ray, does that get to the heart of what you're saying? That'll cover the ground. Okay, so uh, would anyone like to respond to that? Uh, open the floor to that. Laura, go ahead. Well, we can go back to the music idea again. When we see uh, orchestral performance, um, we wonder, how many mistakes were made during the practice of that? How many times did the conductor have to stop everybody dead in their tracks so that everyone could self-adjust? How many times did the music fail to resonate with the inner music? And so, it, yes, there always has to be the adjustment and there has to be the adjuster that we're constantly adjusting our instruments, even as we talk with each other even as we give a, a talk, even the earth itself, we find, is constantly adjusting in its orbit. It's not just a steady going around the sun, but it too is having to make small adjustments as it goes. 
as it meets the forces around us. It's just too bad that we can't be like the conductor on the, in the, as far as the global situation at the present and just say, okay, everybody, just stop what you're doing for a minute, back into your corner, self-adjust and come out and try again. You know, that there is, we need the pairs of opposites in order to tune our instrument and to self-adjust. You know, we often think that nature is proceeding, you know, with absolute total precision without mistakes. But we learn in the secret doctrine, that's not the case. There's, like you were saying, there's lots of micro adjustments in, in the evolutionary process that, you know, uh, the, the higher levels of intelligence are um, employing to move this whole evolutionary pilgrimage forward. So it's not just a human situation, it's, it's actually built into the very fabric of how the universe works. And maybe, the, maybe part of the problem is to define it as mistake is the wrong, is the wrong attitude. Um, it, it, as as um, Laura was saying, it has to do with pursuing an ideal and making adjustments towards the ideal, knowing full well that the ideal can never be realized in its entirety. That only happens in the level of potential. Here on the manifest planes, this constant change and adjustment has to happen, and you might as well get used to it. It's kind of like, you know, embrace the mud. You're going to have to walk through it. Um, it who, let's see, I think Wes was wanting to respond to this too. Well, I was kind of thinking it in, in terms of, of these three major fields, science, religion, and philosophy and thinking about what is it that's missing in each of them that the others provide? And, and it's a really broad kind of question, but it would seem that Blavatsky's fundamental propositions early in the secret doctrine actually address these kinds of, these sorts of issues uh, in, a, in a sense of really religion, science, and philosophy. Uh, the, the, these, are, these are necessary approaches and, and, and sometimes Science by itself, understanding how things work isn't sufficient. There has to be a, some kind of a, a, an inner, inner motive. Uh, and, and, and that sometimes is, is done through the, the auspices of philosophy, kind of figuring out things having to do with meaning. And, and other times it, it has to do with interconnectedness. What, 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 what should we do and why should we do it in relation to other people? So all of these fields are, are really essential parts of, of the, the, the human experiment, of the human endeavor. And there, that's why Blavatsky called her secret doctrine the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, because all of them, each by themselves, is, is actually inadequate to either explain ourselves or, or help us get by in the world. And we do see in, in the, the applications of, of uh, how people in the world, how those, particularly in the West, have used science and religion and philosophy in, in totally destructive ways. Uh, so that if a scientist isn't asking about why they should do something and, and what's, what are the ethical implications of an action, or a religion is not considering the real structure of, of how humans in the world are, then we're going to make mistakes. And that's really why all three are necessary. And that under this kind of total auspice of, of what we call the search for truth, the, the path that we take collectively as well as individually. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the end of our time together. I, I want to remind uh, everybody that we're going to reconvene in a couple of weeks with uh, an International White Lotus Day gathering, which should be really fun and wonderful. We had a, just a wonderful time together last year and we decided to do it again. And if you go to the Universal Theosophy website, um, you can find the place to sign up. I'll probably be sending out an email to everybody who attended the lectures, um, inviting them to come. But let's, let's um, if you don't mind, let's close the meeting with a passage from the Voice of the Silence that I think speaks to our topics and speaks to our, our, the community of us, fellow truth seekers that um, I think resonates to all of us. 
when it says, before thou canst approach the foremost gate, thou hast to learn to part thy body from thy mind, to dissipate the shadow, to live in the eternal. For this, thou hast to live and breathe in all, as all that thou perceivest breathes in thee, to feel thyself abiding in all things, all things in self. Thou shalt not let thy senses make a playground of thy mind. Thou shalt not separate thy being from being and the rest, but merge the ocean in the drop and the drop within the ocean. So shalt thou be in full accord with all that lives. Bear love to men as though they were thy brother pupils, disciples of one teacher, the sons of one sweet mother. Of teachers there are many. The master soul is one, Aliyah, the universal soul. Live in that master as its ray in thee. Live in thy fellows as they live in it. Thank you everybody for attending and coming and we'll see you hopefully in some one of our discussion groups or other gatherings and uh, blessings to everybody. Yeah. And, and thank you for your participation. <laughs> Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> very, Thank very you. much. Bye bye. Good job, Monica. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Jerry, fine. for being the moderator, too. Oh, my pleasure. Talks were wonderful. Au revoir et merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Goodbye, David.